Uh, right, well, afternoon or good evening, I should really say, shouldn't I, everybody? Yes. And um, tonight we're going to look at uh, 2014 uh, from a prophecy point of view. It, and it's amazing, really, that we're here again, because it doesn't really seem five minutes ago since we were doing the exact same thing, but there was 2013 on the slide. And it doesn't seem that long when it said 2012 and 2011 and 2010, I think, was the first time that we uh, started doing this. And I think it's fair to say that uh, each year gets uh, ever more dramatic, would you, when, when you look at the things that are happening in the news. Um, we were just talking with Richard just before it started, and I think if we you know, had, had cut out the last sort of, I don't know, five years or ten years and move from that point to this point that we're at now, we would be amazed at, at what we're seeing. I mean, we're still amazed now at what we're seeing, but we've seen the things building up uh, over time. And so perhaps it loses some of its uh, dramaticness, if there is such a word. Um, so we're on, we're on this journey, aren't we, through life? There's this wide road that the world is all on. And of course, this wide world that the road is on, uh, that the world is on, is is actually, as we know, uh, leading to worldwide judgment and a time of trouble such as never was. And people are blindly going around their everyday lives, uh, eating and drinking and buying and selling. I have no idea what is about to take place on this earth, uh, because it's a, a tremendously dramatic thing that is. Uh, going to happen. The time of trouble, I think even we, you know, probably don't fully appreciate uh, just how bad the time of trouble uh, is coming on this earth. But of course, that isn't really why we focus so much on prophecy and looking at what's going on. It's because, of course, as we go down this road, eventually uh, it will lead directly into the kingdom, as Luke said in his prayer. And um, the, we've got to go through this time and we've got to be looking at these signs so that we're wide awake for the day when the Lord Jesus Christ appears in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So we're going to have a look at some things that have happened in 2014. Obviously, there's a huge amount, as I always say, and how do we fit it all into an hour? And the answer generally is I don't, <laughs> and it goes over an hour. But we'll try and uh, do it in, in as... Uh, uh, you know, the right sort of time frame for, for us all. So, okay, 2014. If I was going to ask you, and in fact I am, uh, what are the key things that happened in 2014 from a prophecy point of view that we should be interested in, what would you say? More belligerent Russia. R uh, Russia, exactly. Who, who said, was that uh, Barry said Russia? Yes, so... We've got the situation in Russia. And uh, Barry said, uh, belligerent Russia. You hadn't seen the slides, had you, Barry? But there we are. You see, we are well connected uh, mentally with that. So we certainly do need to have a look at Russia, don't we? Because that was a big, big news story. Uh, but we're going to look at that in a little bit of detail to see exactly what went on. And um, obviously, we're going to look to see what the Bible says in relation to, to what's been going on. So Russia is a big, big story. Any other big stories from a prophecy uh, point of view? Yeah? The, uh, the controversy over the Temple Mount. <coughs> right. Growing and growing. Yes. Yeah, so we've got, uh, if I could put it in a slightly wider picture, we've got a, a growing conflict in relation to Israel. In fact, of course, we saw uh, actual conflict, didn't we, in the middle of the year uh, in, in Israel, and we're seeing increasing... Uh, tensions uh, in the region, so we're certainly going to uh, have a look and see what's happening in relation to uh, 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 into Israel. Yes, Richard? Um, <clears throat> greater isolation of Israel, especially with the United Nations and nations of Europe declaring the Arab cause. Right, so there's, uh, again, in relation to Israel, <coughs> and we'll certainly pick up on this, uh, the, 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 the nations um, voting <laughs> against Israel, dividing it in two, um, and, we, and we'll have a look at that most uh, certainly, yes, that will come under the Israel heading again. Anything else? There's one big sort of news story that we didn't mention once last year, and that was because we'd never heard of it. Oh, ISIS. 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 
So this time last year, were, were, were we mentioning ISIS? Had we ever heard of ISIS? And yet there we have now the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or IS, the Islamic State, a caliphate suddenly, well it was, from my point of view, appeared from nowhere. I don't know whether anybody else had been watching it uh, quietly develop, but I don't, I don't really think many people had. I was looking back through news reports beforehand to, to see if I'd missed something or whatever, but there was no mention of it really at all. And bursting onto our scenes uh, was, this, uh, was this caliphate uh, that covers basically um, um, a, a large territory inside Iraq and <coughs> Syria. And of course, the third one there that we've got, which is um, uh, the situation in Israel. These uh, slides look to be fairly dark on the screen compared to my laptop here. So uh, are you able to see this okay? Right, so those are the three big headings, okay, that we're going to look at. We're going to look at the situation with Russia. We're going to have a look and have, an, uh, have a look at ISIS and see uh, what the Bible might say about that. And we're going to have a look at, uh, in some detail, at what's happening uh, in Israel. Lots of other things happened uh, during the year. No shadow of a doubt about that. Um, but basically, those are the three things that we are going to, uh, to, to look at. You've all gone in the dark now. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, that's excellent. So, what we're going to do, first of all, then, is have a look at Russia. So, I've gone on to uh, some news websites to find one that, in around about two minutes, was going to summarize the situation in Russia. So here's the news clip. It's an American uh, news organization, well-known American news organization. And in roughly two minutes, they try and uh, go through the situation in Russia. So, so here we go with, uh, with Russia. It's been a year of conflict and turmoil for Russia's president, Vladimir Putin. His country is tipping towards recession, plummeting oil prices. Oil and gas make up more than half of all Russian exports, are crippling the economy. Western sanctions have barred Russian banks and companies from global capital markets, leading to the ruble losing about 40% of its value. As 2014 draws to a close, Standard & Poor's is considering cutting Russia's credit rating to junk status. Now, many in Moscow's middle class find themselves no longer able to afford the imported goods and overall standard of living to which they've grown accustomed. Russia's relations with the West are the worst they've been since the Cold War. A year ago, German Chancellor Angela Merkel was one of Mr. Putin's reliable partners. Now, she warns of the danger he poses. NATO countries are still seething over Mr. Putin's seizing back in March of the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine. And few will soon forget these images bodies and plane wreckage strewn across Ukrainian territory controlled by pro-Russian separatists. In July, Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 exploded after allegedly being shot down by an anti-aircraft missile. 298 people were killed. It took weeks for an international team to get access to the crash scene and properly recover the bodies. Ukraine and U.S. officials blame the attack on Russian-backed militants. Mr. Putin and Russian state media blame Ukraine. A final crash report isn't expected until next summer. Despite all this, there's no problem Mr. Putin doesn't have. His apparent popularity with the Russian people. Even with their confidence in the economy slipping, 80% of Russians still seem to support him. They see him as a tough leader, capable of standing up to the West. The solution to, not the cause of, Russia's pressing problems. Okay, so that seemed to me to be a fairly uh, accurate review of the things that were happening uh, in, in Russia there. Uh, the other thing that I thought uh, we'd, we'd have a look at is, that obviously each week I'm doing the weekly World Watch uh, slides, and one of the things that I tend to do at the end of the year is sort of collate all of the slides together that are in relation to one particular topic, so for instance Russia. So obviously over the year, there's lots and lots and lots of slides, lots and lots of uh, different subjects. So, but when you go back and sort of pull out all of the headlines in relation to one of those subjects, and then literally watch it all the way through, it's quite an amazing thing. Well, I, I find it so. So what I've done is gone back with Russia and pretty much <coughs> pulled out the headlines, not all of them, otherwise we'd be here all night, but have pulled out all of the headlines in relation to Russia, and they're going to flow in a minute chronologically from the start of the year right the way through to the end. And uh, what I'm going to do is literally read out the headlines that were coming out of the newspapers 
as, as the events were, were happening. And you're going to see uh, the headline straight from the Telegraph or wherever it was. And in the top right hand corner you'll see the date. And we're going to rattle through these very, very quickly. And in two and a half minutes we're going to do the whole year in headlines. And just so you don't get too bored as I read these out to you, I've got some uh, music playing in the background, okay? So, uh, so, so, so here we go. So, and all this has got to be time to finish when the music finishes, so uh, otherwise it looks a bit wrong. So, so, so here we go with this. I might have to adjust the uh, sound in a minute. So, you'll have to read that one yourself. There we go, right. So, Foreign Minister criticises West for supporting Ukraine protests. War of words between Obama and Putin over Ukraine. <coughs> Financial crisis threatens Russia as Ukraine spins out of control. Russia war games over Ukraine prompt American warning. Ukraine accuses Russia of armed invasion after Crimea airports blockaded. Ukraine pleads for Britain and America to come to its rescue as Russia accused of invasion. World scrambles as Russia tightens grip on Crimea. Putin has transformed Russian army into a lean, mean fighting machine. Putin mocks the West and threatens to turn off gas supplies. Angela Merkel, Russia will not get away with annexation of Crimea. Russia and the West fail in last minute Ukraine talks. NATO chief, Crimea invasion could be just the beginning. Russia risks new Cold War, West warns as Putin prepares to swallow Crimea. Russian troop buildup now covers in essentially the entire Ukrainian border. New statesman, it's time to rearm, the West must stop appeasing Russia. G8 suspends Russia for annexation of Crimea. NATO orders end to cooperation with Russia. NATO military chief, Russia could take Ukraine in three days. Vladimir Putin threatens to turn off the gas. West threatens new Russia sanctions as Kiev warns of World War III. Ukraine crisis, G7 agree new, new sanctions on Russia. NATO official, Russia, now an adversary. Russia conducts large-scale nuclear attack exercise. Russia shows off military might in parade in Moscow's Red Square. Vladimir Putin makes triumphant visit to Crimea as 20 separatists killed. US releases satellite images of Russian forces near Ukraine borders. Time magazine, Premier, President, Tsar, what Putin wants. Russia threatens nuclear strikes over Crimea. Britain and America implicate Russia in flight MH17 missile attack. Russia threatens to hit British companies in retaliation for sanctions. Russia introduces ban on most food imports from EU and US. Putin, don't mess with nuclear armed Russia. Putin privately threatened to invade Poland, Romania and the Baltic states. Russia will add 80 new warships to Black Sea Fleet, says its fleet commander. Russia deploying tactical nuclear arms in Crimea. Moscow caught watching Israel from Syrian border. Ukraine accuses Russia of sending 32 tanks into rebel-held territory. Russia sends warships north of Australia in pure art display. Putin stockpiles gold as Russia prepares for economic war. David Cameron compares Russia to Nazi Germany on eve of Putin meeting. Angela Merkel warns Russia could seek to destabilize the whole of the European peaceful order. 
Vladimir Putin vows that the United States will never subjugate Russia. Russia faces recession as oil crash and sanctions cost the economy 90 billion pounds. Putin, West is trying to defang the Russian bear. Official, Russia plotting to start war on Israel. And that's December the 20th, and we finished on time there. So, those are the headlines. That's quite dramatic, isn't it, when, when you see it like that? Just one headline on its own is dramatic. When you see the year uh, being played out in, in, in that sort of way, it's a very, very powerful uh, thing that's been happening this year. This, this headline is just astounding, uh, I, I think, because this one is saying that um, Russia is in such a, a, a deep hole right now because of the economic situation that they're actually planning to ignite a war, lo and behold, in Israel. So it actually says there, Russia's planning to ignite a war in Israel in an, an, in an alleged contingency plan to trigger a direct military conflict between Hezbollah and Syrian President Bashar al-Assad's regime. That's not saying Hezbollah and uh, Syria are going to be fighting against each other. They're saying that those two powers will be uh, ignited to fight against uh, Israel. And so we'll look more at that in, in just a moment, but that is... Uh, uh, of course, very serious uh, situation indeed. And perhaps one that we can see with Bible in hand as well. So there's all the things that have been going on in Russia. And uh, before we open our Bibles and look to see what's actually been, uh, how we compare what's been going on to our Bibles, I think what we'll do next is have a look at uh, Israel. So the, the next thing we're going to do is play another video, uh, again from the same news agency, couple of minutes uh, reviewing primarily what's been going on I think in the uh, in, in the uh, conflict that happened there in the middle of the year. So uh, let's just have a look at that now. So this is from the BBC News. Israel launched its latest military offensive a week ago on July the 8th. Since then, more than 170 Palestinians have been killed, most of them civilians. At least 1,200 have been wounded. Over the same period, almost 800 Palestinian rockets have hit Israel. Another 200 have been intercepted. Some Israelis have been injured, but so far, no one has been killed. Just how this latest escalation came about is inevitably the subject of debate. But a climate of heightened tension was created by the kidnapping and killing of three young Israelis in the West Bank and a young Palestinian in Jerusalem. The political environment was already poisonous. Eight months of US-sponsored diplomacy had collapsed, and Israel had condemned an effort by the two main Palestinian factions, Fatah and Hamas, to patch up their own bitter feud. As for Gaza, well, it's been under a severe military and economic blockade ever since Hamas took control in 2007. Israel allows in humanitarian supplies, including food and fuel, and says the blockade is vital for its own security. Aid agencies say it keeps most of the Gaza Strip's 1.8 million Palestinians living in poverty. And remember, more than half of these people are already refugees. The role of Egypt is vital in all this. While the Muslim Brotherhood was in power in Cairo, it opened its own Rafah border crossing into Gaza and allowed smugglers to use hundreds of tunnels below it. But the new government of President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is much less sympathetic to Hamas. The crossing is largely closed. Most of the tunnels have been destroyed. And if the events of the past week feel very familiar, that's because we've been here before. This is the third substantial Israeli assault on the Gaza Strip in recent years, all launched with the same stated purpose, to stop the rockets. In December 2008, it launched Operation Cast Lead, which included a major ground offensive. Four years later came Operation Pillar of Defense. This time, Israeli forces did not invade. The latest operation is called Protective Edge, the army stands poised to enter the Gaza Strip, but the order to go in en masse has not yet been given. So there we are, we remember those events, and we're going to have a look in just a second again, as we did with uh, Russia. We'll go through some headlines right now uh, from the uh, Weekly World Watch, which I'll, I'll read out. But you'll see, I think, something quite interesting that perhaps maybe we forgot that happened before that war 
actually began. Um, and I think when we, uh, again, run this through, well, it surprised me when I looked through and suddenly you can see something quite interesting that uh, happened just before the Gaza war actually began. So uh, here we go, I'm going to read out uh, these headlines uh, again, all in relation to Israel, not quite so many to, uh, to get through, uh, but uh, here we go. So, Israel celebrates 66 years of independence, May the 6th. Pope Francis makes his first official visit to the Holy Land. Pope invites Israeli and Palestinian leaders to Vatican peace prayers. Pope Francis hosts Middle East peace prayer at the Vatican. Exactly one month later to the day, Hamas fires rockets at Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Israel launches ground offensive in Gaza. Gaza death toll passes 300 as UN Chief Ban Ki-moon heads to Israel. Hamas calls for third intifada after violent riots in Jerusalem and West Bank. Israel calls up 16,000 more reservists as US supplies army with ammunition. Gaza troops holding as 10,000 Israelis join protests in Tel Aviv. And now we see these events happening following the Gaza war. UK MPs vote overwhelmingly in favour of recognising Palestinian state. Sweden recognises Palestinian state on October the 30th. November the 26th, Palestine recognises a state in principle by the European Parliament in symbolic vote. December the 2nd, Palestinian states with the French National Assembly votes overwhelmingly to ask the government to recognise Palestine. Israel slams Irish decision to recognise Palestine on December the 11th. Israeli PM slams Europe taking Hamas off terror list. That was on December the 17th. Israel announces discovery of offshore gas field, the third one to be found in the past five years. We've already looked at this slide, Russia plotting to start war on Israel. And on uh, Boxing Day, IDF deploys Iron Dome uh, in rising Gaza tensions. So it's quite an interesting pattern of events there, don't you think, when you, when you see that uh, flowing through with the peace prayer, and uh, literally a month later, well, we didn't see peace but we saw uh, war. So there we go. We've looked at uh, Russia. We've had a look at um, what's been happening uh, in Israel. And I'm just going to play a short video clip about uh, ISIS, and then we'll uh, open our Bibles and uh, have a look and see what the Bible says we should be looking for. So again, this is a, a news clip. It's the same channel as the original, as the first American one that we looked at. So uh, hopefully you can hear it okay and uh, we'll have a look and see what was happening with this new group called ISIS. June 10th. The radical Islamist group known as the Islamic State dramatically raises its ruthless profile in a series of lightning raids inside Iraq, including overtaking the country's second largest city, Mosul. The group, also known as ISIS or ISIL, started as Al-Qaeda's branch in Iraq before morphing into its own entity and expanding into Syria. They quickly earn a reputation for viciousness, holding mass executions of captured Iraqi and Syrian troops, beheading Western journalists and aid workers, and then posting graphic videos of these acts online. In fact, the footage is used as propaganda to beckon foreigners to come join the battle to create a pure Islamic state. An unknown number have. President Barack Obama says the U.S. can wait no longer. It must get involved. Left unchecked, these terrorists could pose a growing threat beyond that region. He orders airstrikes and forges a coalition that includes Arab countries. But Mr. Obama pledges no American boots on the ground. Others will have to do the fighting in what he says will be a years-long effort. Officials say months of sorties have slowed ISIS's momentum, but there are few signs that ISIS has been snuffed. Far from it. And heading into 2015, world leaders remain unable to answer the question when, how, and by whom these jihadists will be stopped. Okay, so that's all we're going to say from the news review part of uh, uh, ISIS, but we'll look at them more uh, as, as, we, as we go through right now. So those are the three big events, and I guess one of the questions in our minds might be, how do all these things tie together? How does the Hamas 
Hezbollah situation fit in with the with the Russian situation? How does that fit in with the European situation? How does it fit in with uh, the ISIS situation? How does all this come together? And that's what we're going to try and answer, okay? So what I'm going to suggest to you is, and you might not have heard this before, because I um, basically haven't read it anywhere before, but this is... I guess, uh, just by re reading the Word of God, this is where, this is my conclusion to how all these things fit together. You might disagree uh, with what I'm about to say, but um, this is what we're going to uh, try and demonstrate. I'm going to try and uh, prove to you that, in fact, there isn't just one final conflagration, uh, one final great big war. There are, in fact, three stages to the final judgment of the world. Uh, there is stage one, there's stage two, and there's stage three. And I think once you see that there are different stages, we're not trying to force all events into, say, just one chapter uh, and try and make everything fit into one place. I think once you see that there are different stages to it, and they're clearly defined separate stages uh, to the final judgment of the world, then suddenly lots of things, I believe, fall, fall into place that might have been a bit tricky to see uh, beforehand. So in terms of the different stages, this, this is the way uh, I uh, uh, am viewing these different uh, passages. So the second stage, and it's one that we as a community have focused a lot in on, is quite rightly the Ezekiel 38 stroke Daniel chapter 11, one might even say partly Daniel chapter 8 uh, situation, which is actually, I believe, stage 2 of the final uh, time of trouble and judgment of the world. And these chapters deal with uh, nine nations. So when you look at Ezekiel 38, there are in fact nine nations that are mentioned there. And those nine nations are Magog, Meshach, Tubal, Rosh, Persia, Tokamar, Goma, Ethiopia, and Libya. And we can have a look and see who those uh, nations uh, are, but I think, you know, suffice to say, that uh, on, on any sort of ancient map, which was, uh, the, you know, that would have been at the round about the time of Ezekiel himself, those nations uh, are, are clearly identifiable <coughs> as predominantly uh, Russia, uh, Turkey, and um, Ethiopia, as we now would know, it's uh, probably more like North Sudan and Libya. What I don't think is that there's any element in amongst that of uh, Europe as we now know it. This is, uh, this is the eastern leg, if you like, of, uh, of Daniel's uh, image. Of course, uh, 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 there's many books that will argue that Goma represents uh, you know, parts of Europe. I just don't, I don't think it does. I think what we're looking at here are nine nations, and we'll look on a map in a minute as, as to where they are. Um, there is a stage that comes before that, and the stage that comes before the invasion, this second stage, this, in, this uh, invasion headed up with Russia, is an initial stage which is detailed out primarily in Psalm 83 and Isaiah 17, but I'm going to show you at the very end of all this, there's another very, very key couple of chapters in Zechariah that also detail out these two separate events very clearly. But in uh, Psalm 83, these aren't uh, nations that are mentioned here. They're ten tribes. And the ten tribes that are mentioned in Psalm 83 are Edom and the Ishmaelites and Moab and the Hagrites and Gebel and Ammon and Amalek and Philistia, Tyre and Assyria, or Asa, it says in the authorised version. This is stage one that comes before stage two. It's part of the final overall uh, story, but it is definitely happening before uh, stage two. The final stage, stage three, involves not ten tribes or ten nations, but in fact ten uh, kings, and these people are uh, really nothing to do with stage two or stage one. Uh, these are mentioned specifically uh, in Revelation 17, and of course uh, in also in, Revela uh, in, in Daniel as well. But these uh, people, which we haven't really got the time to look at in any detail this evening, we know from Revelation 17 are a harlot woman and beast and ten horns uh, and uh, ten kings. And we know that this is uh, a, a, a war 
with um, the, the, religious, the religion of Rome and Europe <coughs> against the Lord Jesus Christ. That is nothing to do with this war. It's nothing to do with this war. Now, there are three parts to this war because they're doing three different things. And the first stage I am going to show you is all to do with Israel's relatives. These tribes that are surrounding Israel, they're not all related, don't get me wrong, but many of them are related uh, to Israel. These peoples that are surrounding uh, Israel itself, I'm calling them Israel's relatives. And it's a war about the actual land itself. Stage two isn't about the land. Somebody wanted to tell me, make sure you're still awake. What is stage two? What is the objective of stage two, according to Ezekiel 38? Spoil. Spoil. That's nothing to do with religion, is it? Spoil has nothing whatsoever to do with religion. It's actually got nothing really to do with land. It's about spoil. We're told that categorically that's what it's about. And therefore, this isn't about relatives, this is about riches. But stage three is not about relatives, and it's not about riches. It's not about spoil. It's not even about the land. What is it that the final stage three is actually all about? What one word could sum up the final, final war? As you say, religion. In fact, of course... I haven't got time to show you this, but if you remember, in 1 Corinthians, the Lord Jesus Christ, we're told, puts down all rule, authority, and power. And those three things that the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a little study for you at some point, but all rule, authority, and power are the three stages to, to, to this uh, conflict. Because those three definitions, rule, authority, and power, link back exactly into those three things that take uh, place. So, um, you might not buy into this, it, you know, you, you've got to have a look to see whether you see if it fits in your mind. But we're now going to go through, and what I'm going to do to start with, you just start off with stage two, because of course the focus in stage two is to do with Russia, and we've looked at Russia on our screens. The focus of stage one is to do with Israel and its immediate neighbours, and we're going to therefore see how that uh, clicks in. And if we've got just a couple of minutes, we'll put up a slide or two just about stage three and the religious aspect. So what about these nine nations then of Ezekiel 38? Well, as we've already said, I'm going to put up the names on the screen. Hopefully you can just about read that. That says Magog. And next to it in brackets, I'm putting where... I think, according to ancient maps, the, uh, the territory is. Now, some have written and said, well, of course, that is the territory it was, but we need to track the migration of where the people went to. And I don't think that is scripturally sound to actually say where the people have migrated to. Otherwise, Israel is no longer Israel because the people migrated all over the place. So Israel is now in, a, in New York or somewhere. It is nothing to do where people migrate to. It's where they lived at the time Ezekiel was writing. And that unlocks many, many things. So Magog, uh, at the time that uh, Ezekiel was writing, was in what we now call southern Russia. We'll put all this on a map in a minute. Meshek is what we would now know as central Russia. Tubal, we would now know as eastern Russia. And Rosh, we would now know as northern Russia. Persia, we would now know as Iran. Togomar, we would call now Eastern Turkey. And Goma, we would call Western Turkey. Libya, we would call, well, Monday Libya in Northern Africa. And Ethiopia is actually pretty much the current territory of Northern Sudan. So that's how I see Ezekiel 38. Now the interesting thing, of course, is when you drop this onto a map, it looks quite strange. Because there it is on a map. So everything in this solid dark colour here is basically the, the territories that we've just listed out. So we've got all of Russia up here. We've got Turkey here. We've got Iran here. We've got Ethiopia here. We've got Libya in this territory over here. You'll notice that I've completely excluded 
Europe and the UK out of this because I just don't think it's uh, I don't think it's mentioned. I think there's a division straight down the line here. The two legs of Daniel's image are causing that division, and that division is clear uh, for us to see even today. But what is it that strikes you quite interesting from that map? Anything that grab anything that grabs you about that map? They're not immediately surrounding Israel. Yeah. Right. Nobody's touching Israel. There's a hole in the middle of it all. There's this gap in the centre of it all. Now, is it the fact that all of those nations are at peace with Israel? Is it, is it the fact that all those nations are friendly with Israel, so we wouldn't expect them to be fighting against Israel? Well, the answer to that, of course, is that all of those nations, uh, well, not all of them, but certainly some of them, are, and certainly peoples within those, uh, within those areas, uh, certainly are very... Uh, well, not, not, not on side with Israel at all and are their enemies. So especially when you look at uh, Syria, especially when you look at Iraq, uh, certainly elements within um, um, uh, Lebanon. So let's just have a look and uh, have a look at this a little bit more uh, in a little bit more detail. So I just want to show you something interesting here because one of the key things is is well, have a look at this. Let's open our Bibles. Have a look at Ezekiel 38. <coughs> there we go, we've got a bit of light now. So, uh, Ezekiel 38. We've read it a lot of times, but just think about this for a second. It says in verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Magog. Now, if I was to ask you... Um, you know, where is Gog from? Well, you'd probably have to say he's of the land of Magog. Because Gog primarily is of the land of Magog. He's also of some other places. He's also chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. But the, the number one place that the, this man is being associated with is Magog. Now, there's a lot of people say, well, Magog, of course, is Germany. So we're basically saying that Gog is of Germany and also of Meshach and Tubal. I just don't think that is the case. And in fact, uh, historians will tell you that it isn't the case because uh, Josephus, uh, who wrote this book, Antiquities of the Jews, in his chapter 6, says, Magog founded those that were from him were called the Magogites, but are now called by the Greeks the Scythians. So when you understand that the, the Magogites and the Scythians are one and the same people, according to Josephus, you then find uh, maps of where Scythia actually was, and it's absolutely nothing to do with Germany. It's actually all to do with what we've been saying all along. It's southern Russia. And what is astounding about this particular map here, and it's not just one that I happen to find that does this, most of them do this. Here is Scythia in this orange blob all around here, but do you notice that this orange blob comes right over into this territory here? And the reason it goes a slightly different colour is because I've superimposed onto it the current territory of the country of, the Uc of, of Ukraine. And what is astounding about that is that ancient Scythia cut Ukraine exactly in half. So this blue line coming around here is the whole of, U uh, the whole of Ukraine. And ancient Scythia cut Ukraine exactly in half. And so Gog, who was originally a real and historical person who actually ran the area of Scythia, which is now predominantly southern Russia, therefore is a Russian leader, we're told is of the land of Magog. So this is all Magog, but notice it's pushing into eastern Ukraine. Now tell me, what's on the news at the moment? But Putin ruler of southern Russia taking over eastern Ukraine. Is that not what's on our news? Do you think this is a coincidence? It isn't. It's nothing to do with taking over Germany. In fact, Germany and Russia have pulled apart over this. Absolutely wrenched apart. Um, but he is determined to take over eastern Ukraine, which is the ancient part of ancient Magog, ancient Scythia. Now, Gog, of course as I've already said, was most certainly a real and historical person. This book here called The Empire of the Tsars, uh, written by an historian called Ragazin, 
says that Go, King of Magog, was originally a real and historical person, none other in fact than chief of the Scythians. Same thing that Josephus said, Scythia and Magog, same thing, Gog is ruling them. And of course, Gog, if you look it up in Strong's Concordance, means a mountain. This is somebody that sees himself on high, who's very proud and puffed up, who sees himself looking down on everybody else and mighty and uh, powerful. Now, of course, our, our, uh, our current uh, leader over there, or the current leader, I should say, is this man here, of course, Vladimir Putin. Now, this man, when you stop and look at this character and what he's like and what he's doing, ticks the boxes in relation to uh, the man that we're looking for, a latter-day Antiochus Epiphanes, a latter-day King of the North, <coughs> extremely aggressive, anti-Israel, and pushing now at, at, at his borders. If we wanted to invent a character that would fit the description of Gog, would we not invent Vladimir Putin? Now, in this chapter that we're looking at, of course, it says in verse 10, Thus saith the Lord God, it shall come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go to the land of unwalled villages to take a spoil and to take a prey. So this man decides to be motivated by spoil, by, <coughs> by goods, by cash, by something to do with what he can get materially from this adventure, horrific adventure, by coming down into the Middle East. Nothing to do with religion, is there? When you read that, there's no religious element to this war whatsoever. It's purely about the money. Which, of course, gets interesting when we see this headline, which we've already looked at, that Israel announces discovery of offshore gas field. And, of course, this is now uh, the third one that's been found in just very, very recent years. They've been there for over 60 years before they found any of this stuff. And now they're the largest gas finds in the world in the last 10 or 15 years. These are immense uh, gas finds that have now made Israel an exporter of gas uh, into uh, the region. Um, and there's a, a number of um, Arab countries and uh, even Europe that's looking at uh, buying this gas off Israel. Now, why that is interesting is because of this. Russia is in suddenly a massive crisis, of course, since the um, invasion of Ukraine. There is absolutely no coincidence that there's Russia's uh, ruble in red, and there is Brent oil price in blue. And Russia goes in around about here, and then suddenly, overnight, oil... Uh, well, the gas price, or the oil price, sorry, in the ruble collapse. The two are obviously re related, and this is collapsing because the blue line is collapsing. The oil price collapsing is crippling Russia. It's gone from positive GDP into negative recession within months. And that is because the bulk of the Russian economy is depending on its gas and oil sales. And when those prices collapse to the extent that they have, it causes massive pain. Now this blue line on here, or greeny pillared line, is where Russia needs the price to be to balance its books. If it drops below that line, it's in all sorts of trouble. It says there, look, they need, they need oil to be at $105 a barrel. And today, for the first time in many, many years, it dropped below $50 a barrel. So it's even below, this is at 60 here, it's now below the bottom line. That's how fast it's going down. It's half the price it was. Now, how's that happened? This has happened through Saudi Arabia pumping oil at maximum capacity. Now, why are they doing that? Because this is hurting them as well. This is seriously hurting them. It is because, and why is America suddenly flooding its uh, fracking uh, scheme that it's got over in, on its territory, it's flooding the market with its uh, oil that it's got over there as well. They could stop it overnight by slowing down production, but they're keeping it flat out, causing everybody some pain, apart from us filling up with fuel. 
The country that hurts mostly in all of this is Russia. And what this is, is massive, massive payback from America using Saudi Arabia, its ally, to punish Russia severely for what it's doing. And it's crippling them and causing immense strain on, on Russia. Uh, this is one of the headlines. This is the 23rd of December. Did the Saudis and America collude in dropping oil prices? This isn't some you know, crazy website that's trying to come out with all conspiracy theories. This is a, you know, Reuters, which are basically saying, look, you know, something's going on here. Now, what is remarkable about all of this is this man, over 150 years ago, wrote this. <coughs> so John Thomas, in his book, Alpis Israel, published in 1849, said these words, let the Russian treasury be as empty as it, as it is said to be, and its expenditure exceed its revenue by double the alleged deficit. It will only operate as a pressure from within, causing her autocrat, Gog, to enter into the countries and to overflow and pass over, and to enrich himself with the spoil of those he is destined to subdue. Now that man had great insight. Foresight. What was he doing, though? He was reading the Bible 160 odd years ago and worked out that if Russia is coming to take a spoil, there must be a hook to put in its jaws to pull it down, and that must mean there's internal pressure, and he worked it out. That's astounding, isn't it, in the lives of what we're seeing? Do you not think that is just incredible that he saw that? And, and, and here's another way of looking at it. So here's the Russian bear. Here's the sanctions causing enormous pain, and here is Britain and America predominantly, and little Russia, uh, Europe stood there. But another way of looking at this cartoon is the King of the South, says Daniel 11 verse 40, which is Britain and America predominantly in Saudi Arabia, shall push, which means to provoke, at him, which is talking about uh, Putin and Gog and the King of the North, and then the king of the north comes against him like a whirlwind. So the king of the south provokes the king of the north, and because of that, the king of the north comes down. That is what is playing out. Now, there is more provocation <coughs> maybe to come. The sanctions that we're seeing are winding Russia up to a huge extent, but there could well be more provocation, because that word push actually literally means to gore, like, a, like a, an animal with a horn would gore somebody. So it's some serious amount of pain that's being caused. But you might well say that what's going on here is causing serious pain, wouldn't you? So now Putin sat there with a major problem on his hands, and tonight, I guarantee you, he's sat with advisors right now saying, what are we going to do? Oil has now fallen below $50 a barrel. We are now in some serious trouble. We're burning cash at a rate of knots, there's a crisis in the air. They've put interest rates up from 6% to 17.5% to try and hold up the ruble, and not, none of it's working. They're, they're bailing out the banks. They're on the edge of a precipice. So Putin is sat there, and I think what he's look, thinking about doing is this. You know what we could do? We could cause trouble. We could cause some serious trouble. Because one surefire way of getting oil prices shifting back up is to cause trouble. And one way that oil prices always shoot back up is through conflict and war. And so what you might well be thinking is, I'm going to set fire to somewhere. And lo and behold, while we were thinking these thoughts, this headline that we've already quoted appears as a WND exclusive saying Russia Sorry, Russia is plotting to start a war on Israel. A French official has revealed the plan as Russia's weapon against America and the European Union amid increasing sanctions on Moscow. According to WND, the official who has requested his identity to remain unknown said Russia's plan to start a war in Israel was born out of Russia's increasing isolation due to Western sanctions. Now that's quite astounding, don't you think? Is it unbelievable? I don't think it is unbelievable. I think it's highly likely 
that we might see this happen. And therefore, coming back to this bit here, <coughs> if Russia does drop a match into uh, the middle, into uh, the area around Israel, what does it actually do but sparks off uh, stage one? Russia itself could spark off stage one, and when stage one actually uh, is finished and completed, you'll see why in a second it decides to do stage two and invade the vacuum that has been left with the burning situation uh, that, that was uh, left after it had ignited it. So Putin is currently uh, uh, holed up in the Kremlin in his stronghold hold up here, and I'm suggesting might well uh, set fire to this particular region. Which brings us to Psalm 83 and the Ten Tribes. So just as we went through the uh, uh, Ezekiel 38, let's just canter through the peoples, the tribes of Psalm 83. So here's how I interpret the, the nations of Psalm 83. You might want to look up Psalm 83, in fact, um, to, to see where this fits in. And I, I, I truly do believe it does. So it's Psalm 83. Uh, I just might read these words to you from uh, maybe verse 2. It says, For lo, thine enemies make a tumult. So there's some noise going on. This isn't a quiet situation. There's a noise of war. They that hate thee have lifted up their head. There's action. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent, they are confederate against you. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites, of Moab and the Hagarenes, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek, and the Philistines and the inhabitants of Tyre. Asa also is joined with them, and they have been helped by the children of Lot. So there's this group of uh, people here that, you know, are totally and utterly against uh, Israel. So the tents of Edom refers to um, some nomadic people in the Jordan area. And of course, it's in Jordan right now where there is, in fact, tents of Palestinians left over from the creation of Israel. These are people kept in tents even today. They've been there for 50 or 60 years. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of these people now. And this, I believe, are the, the people that are being referred to here. I might have a picture, if I remember to put it in. The Ishmaelites are, a, again, a tribe in northern Saudi Arabia. Uh, Moab is a nation. So this is the one of the few in the list that's actually a nation. And this is Jordan. Uh, the Hagrites are actually a tribe uh, that were based in Jordan. Gebel was a tribe based in northern Lebanon. Ammon was a tribe based in Jordan. Amalek was a tribe based in southern Israel. Uh, Philistia was a tribe which is exactly where we would now see Hamas, the, uh, the Philistines um, and modern day Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Tyre is specifically a city within Lebanon which is, if you look upon Wikipedia, the stronghold of Hezbollah. And Asa, or Assyria, is a nation which corresponds exactly to ISIS. Exactly to ISIS. So let's just put some of those uh, nations on the map. So you see now we've got, here's Israel. Look, there's the northern kingdom and the, the southern kingdom of Judah. There's Philistia, there's Amalek, here's Edom, here's Moab, here's Ammon, here's, a, well, Assyria really is further up around, around here, but they've put it there on the map uh, to fit it in. And there's Tyre, and there's Gebel, and you see how surrounded Israel is by these people. This is a totally different picture, isn't it, to Ezekiel 38. Now, you notice, of course, that in uh, verse 8, it says, Asa is joined with them. So there's a group of people called Asa, and if you look in your uh, in modern versions, it will say Assyria. Now have a look at this. Here's Isis, and this is the territory of Isis in this red blob here, and it's covering some of northern Iraq and north uh, east Syria, and that is their territory. Now when you go in and put um, uh, Assyria, original uh, Assyria, ancient Assyria, 
into your, especially at the time that we're talking about when David was writing, what you'll find, and I haven't made this blob up, this is exactly what came out of Wikipedia, that red blob corresponds to ancient Assyria, and look how it corresponds to the red blob on this map that is uh, indicating um, ISIS. So suddenly upon our scenes have appeared a people forming a caliphate, an Islamic state, whose stated aim actually is to destroy Israel and to create a much wider caliphate in the, in the, in the Levant, which includes Israel, and here they are, based up here. Well, they're killing each other. We know that. But actually, their, their main focus, as with all Islamic uh, re re religion <coughs> on the fanatical side, is to actually bring this little country of Israel uh, to an end. It's quite remarkable that we see ISIS... Uh, appearing on, on our screens right now at this time. Now, of course, uh, other uh, nations, well, not nations, peoples that are mentioned, of course, in here, as we've already said, we've got the Philistines. So the Philistines correspond identically to Hamas. We've got Asa, which is in, based in Syria and northern Iraq. And we've actually got Syria itself threatening uh, Israel last year that we looked at. And we've got the inhabitants of Tyre. It's quite amazing, you know, that um, the uh, inspired writer of Asaph in Psalm 83 doesn't say Lebanon or doesn't say Phoenicia, which would have indicated the whole country of Lebanon. He says the inhabitants of Tyre. And the inhabitants of Tyre correspond exactly to modern-day Hezbollah. And this is the remarkable thing. So all of these nations, all these peoples, I should keep saying, are getting stirred up, we told in Psalm 83, to launch uh, a conflict against Israel. And this is when Isaiah gets fulfilled. Because Isaiah 17 tells us that Damascus is, will be removed from being a city and will become a fallen ruin. Now, to some extent, of course, Damascus has become a ruin. And, uh, and so on. But actually, it hasn't completely ceased from being a city. It is still there, and this man, Assad, still rules as king. But do you know something? Damascus will get removed from being a city. And it's going to happen during stage one. In the same chapter, Isaiah 17, it says the 45 towns of northern Israel, it actually says Ephraim in your Bible, but I've converted Ephraim into, from the code of Ephraim into northern Israel, because that's what it's referring to. The 45 towns of northern Israel will also be destroyed, and the royal power of Damascus will end. In that day, Israel's glory will grow dim. Its robust, robust body will waste away. The whole land will look like a grain field after the harvesters have gathered the grain. This initial conflict, you know, over Israel, by the inner ring of nations and peoples, will cause Israel, northern especially, a great deal of pain. But Israel wins. They destroy completely Damascus. And there's a time of so-called peace. Because Israel's immediate pains in the neck, literal pains in the neck, i.e. Hezbollah and Hamas and Syria, are wiped clean. They're gone, they're finished with. And Israel collapses in a sort of uh, heap after exhausting itself from, from, from this particular war that it goes through and is left intact but beaten up. The others are ruined and destroyed and gone, but Israel is left um, in, in, in quite a difficult situation. And it could be that there's some form of peace agreement that's forced upon Israel at this particular uh, point in time. But it doesn't last very long, because here's what happens. Isaiah 17, I don't, you can't really see this picture because of the, um, uh, the screen's a bit dark, but these are huge waves pouring into a city down here. Because at the end of Isaiah, chapter 17, it says, Listen, the armies of many nations roar like the roaring of the sea. Hear the thunder of the mighty forces as they rush forward like the thundering waves. 
So you see, after Damascus falls, and after stage one is complete, there is then the armies of many nations roaring like the roaring of the sea, rushing into the vacuum that's left. This is, this is, easy, this is Ezekiel 38. It's the outer ring of nations rushing now in to take control of this uh, territory of Israel and Syria and uh, possibly Iraq and um, other parts of that particular area. Now you might say, we well might say when have you finished, but I've nearly finished. But you might say, well fine, but you've grabbed a passage from Psalms and you've grabbed a passage from Ezekiel and you sort of try to say that these, and, and from Isaiah, and try to say that these are separate events and, and, and so on. Is there anywhere else in the Bible that indicates that there is a part one and a part two? And you know something? There is. And they're put nicely together and packaged up beautifully. And we've read it many, many times. And we've always, I think, considered them as one and the same event. But when you stop and switch the light on on this and look at the words and see what it's saying, you suddenly realise, no, they're not the same event at all. All along, God was describing stage one and stage two. And does anybody know where we're going to go? Zechariah. And the answer is Zechariah. You see, Zechariah chapter 12 and Zechariah chapter 14 are not one and the same event. Zechariah chapter 12 begins, I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes the nearby nations, this is a more modern translation, but even in the AV you get the sense of surrounding nations, nearby nations stagger when they send their armies to Jerusalem and Judah. We're specifically told these are surrounding nearby nations. Does that sound like the first inner ring war? Well, it certainly does to me. Now look what it says in verse 6. On that day I will make the clans of Judah like a flame that sets a wood pile ablaze, or like a burning torch among the sheaves of grain. They will burn up all the neighbouring nations right and left, while the people in Jerusalem remain secure. Isn't that astounding? This says Jerusalem survives and actually remains secure. Jerusalem, of course, is in the southern part of Israel. It's basically saying that ultimately there's a war, that their armies come against them, but Israel wins and burns them up. But notice, they burn them with the flame that they've been set alight with. So they have been set alight, and they use that very fire to go and burn them. And Jerusalem survives. Key bit. Nearby nations sending their armies, neighbouring nations, Jerusalem secure. That is exactly what I've been saying, reference stage one. Isaiah then says, all nations now rush into the void and there's a great conflict once more. And what does Zechariah 14 say but exactly that? I will gather all the nations. Now it doesn't say nearby nations anymore. It says all the nations to fight against Jerusalem. Does it say that Jerusalem is secure and survives? No, it jolly well doesn't. It says the city will be taken and the houses looted and the women raped and half the population will be taken into captivity and the rest will be left among the ruins of the city. And you're going to flee. And you're going to flee as you did before the great earthquake in the days of King Gazar of Judah. And then the Lord my God will come with all his holy ones with him. This is the return, actually, of course, of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? With the saints, as it says in the AV. And you see, brothers and sisters, the judgment has taken place somewhere between here. Because how does Jesus return with the saints in Zechariah 14 if the judgment hasn't happened before? You tell me that. It can't. The judgment has come before. Jesus arrives when Gog has decimated Israel with the saints. And he comes because Jerusalem has been actually ruined as a city. It's told, we're told that. And so there is stage one and there is stage two. And then, of course, 
there is still... So Israel's relatives and the land is sorted out. Israel's riches has been sorted out. But there's a final war. And this is Israel's religion. This is a religious war. And we find that, this is pretty much the last slide, depicted as a woman riding a beast. Now here's the interesting thing in Revelation 17. This doesn't talk about Christ coming with the saints. This says something very interesting. The ten horns of the beast, we're told in Revelation, are ten kings. We know that the ten kings are associated with Europe. This is definitely Europe. And we know that the woman riding the beast is definitely Rome, because we're told that the woman sits on seven hills. And the Catholic Encyclopedia itself says Rome is built on the seven hills. They will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast. They will all agree to give him their power and authority. I don't think we've had this yet, but we're close to ten kings actually creating a super state together, excluding Britain. Together, now look what they do. Together they go to war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and his called and chosen and faithful ones are with him. Brothers and sisters, the war of Europe and the Lamb is against an established Lord Jesus Christ and saints in Israel. How could Zechariah 14 be that war? Because Jesus comes at the end of it, after the war is pretty much over. Uh, he comes to rescue the remnant that's there. This is together they will go to war against Jesus. It's We're going to fight this man. We're going to go and fight the people with him. This is a holy war, it's a religious war, and we are heading it up. And if we weren't at all certain that the woman holding the golden cup is anything to do with anything other than this man here, well, there he is in his scarlet and purple colours uh, holding the golden cup uh, in his hand. He's almost done that just to say, look, here I am. And so we really are, uh, you know, I truly do believe, on the brink of the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, because this one thing is for certain. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't have to come, certainly it's got to come before the, the, the third stage. It's got to come before the second stage, because the judgment has been taken place at the time when Christ and the saints uh, arrive with Jesus onto the Mount of Olives when that second war has already been underway. It can come from between now and some point up to then. When it is, we don't know. But I would suggest, looking at all the things that we have seen uh, happen, then it's surely uh, really right at hand. This, this last slide, I haven't put graphically very well yet, because I've only just dreamt this up. But uh, here was what I started off by saying, look, then comes the end when Jesus will have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. His job is to do three things. To put down all rule, authority, and power. Why are we told there's three things? Rule is all to do with territory ruled by a leader. Look it up in Strong's. Rule is all to do with territory ruled by a leader. That's to do with the land. The Palestinians want the land. And that gets sorted out in stage one. Israel keeps the land. But then... There is authority that Jesus has to sort out. And the authority is uh, in the scriptures denoting strength of government. And that is to do with kingship. And the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes back, is removing those who think they're strong and establishing himself as king and removing <laughs> Gog, this mighty mountain who's thinking of taking over the world. And the word power... When you look at power, it's all to do with moral power and the power to do miracles. This is religious power. And the Lord Jesus Christ in the third stage will establish himself not only as king, but as priest when all the godless religion is finally removed. Sorry I've gone on a bit too long, but I'll probably call it a day at that point. Let's hope that 2015 is the year when Jesus does return.